Hi, everyone.、Um, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Reframe series.、Um, if you have liked this podcast so far, please like, leave a comment, and subscribe. It really helps us grow this channel and the series.、Um, so, today we're g o n n a get started by sharing a very special guest with you. Her name is Jyoti Rajan Gopal, and she is a writer, a mom, and a kindergarten teacher. Growing up, she lived in Thailand, Indonesia, Myanmar, India, and China. And 28 years ago, she moved to New York and now lives in Yonkers in a quirky old Victorian with her husband and two daughters. Jyoti currently writes stories that speak to her heart, that reflect her multiple identities, that she wishes her daughters had growing up, and that she wishes her students had now. When not writing or teaching, she loves to work in the garden, dance, and explore the many New York State Park trails. So,、um, just thank you for joining us today. It's such a,、um, it's so wonderful to have you here and to share about the books that you've written.、Um, and I'd love to get us started by just asking you what inspired you to begin writing children's books? Thank you so much for having me, Arbita. I'm so excited to be here.、Um, yeah, I never considered myself a writer growing up or even into adulthood. That was not a part of my life plan or any such thing.、I've, I had always wanted to be a teacher and、um, you know, started teaching kindergarten pretty much right out of college. And、um, I think the first inklings that I had that I was even thinking about writing was when my daughter was in fourth grade. My younger one was in fourth grade. She's now 23. And at that time, she was working on a project about Indira Gandhi for her fourth grade class. And we were doing some research together. And I came across a story that I was sure was like out there in the world.、Um, I had stopped teaching at that point. So I wasn't teaching, I was being a mom. Um, and I was like, I had never seen a picture book about this, but I bet there's one out there. And I looked and didn't find it. And my husband was like, Well, you should write it. And I was like, Nah, I'm not a, like, nah, nah, I'm not writing. I'm not a writer, whatever.、Um, and then very soon after, I broke my leg.、Um, and I was、uh, actually, no, I had started, I was, I was teaching, I was back to teaching at that point. So I was a mom and I was teaching in my ch- children's school.、Um, and so I had to take a six week break from、um, teaching because I had a full cast from like above my knee all the way down to my ankle. And I had to, you know, walk on crutches. And the doctor was like, no, 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 you can't be in kindergarten. So、um, this idea that my husband had planted into my head、uh, sort of sat there and I was like, all right, I'll do some research and I'll just like, Read a little bit more about this, and I'll maybe, maybe I'll do something. And so, from that, I had sort of written the story, and then that was it. I it sat on my computer for the next gajillion years. I did, did nothing with it till about four years ago. And the reason why it sort of came back into my forefront was because I, you know, I had I went back to teaching, I was back in the world of picture books, I had been looking for books for my girls, I had realized that there weren't. A lot of stories available for you know, young Indian American kids or even for you know, children who are not、uh, white. And I、uh, began to sort of feel more and more as I was searching for these stories that maybe I needed to start writing as- these stories because I wasn't finding them.、Um, and that's kind of what got me to- to- into that process. So, that little story that I had sort of created. Back when my daughter was in fourth grade, now she's like in college. Both of them were like much older. They were young women. And I decided that, all right, you know what? I'm just gonna I'm just g o n n a go ahead and get started. And maybe I can write these stories. That's what initially, that's where the inspiration for writing came from.、Um, from that, you know, like what, 2008, I think that was when I first thought of even writing. And then I just shelved it completely. Because I was just like, that's a pipe dream. That's not going to happen. And then I, it resurfaced because I think the more years that I spent teaching and the more I realized how important what it was to have books that reflected so many of my, like, like so many more stories than what I was seeing, the more I felt compelled to like maybe say, okay, maybe I can do this. Yeah. 
Yeah, I um, I remember when we um, when we initially had like this intro conversation. Um, I think one of the things that really struck me about just you creating and writing was um, how powerful it is because. Um, I think due to like a history of colonialism and just kind of a lack of access to resources, a lot of um, a lot of the South Asian community hasn't really had the opportunity to to create these um, these new stories or to um, to really have um, have that narrative written for us about uh, or about us uh, from a South Asian perspective, and so. Uh, I'm just really, um, you know, inspired and honored that now we we have um, we have a South Asian writer who is actually creating stories um, for us uh, about our own histories. Um, so just really appreciating you for that. Oh, yeah, thank you so much. I think you know, and I'm not the only one. There are so many before uh, before me that are sort of laid the foundations um, and have started that work. I certainly there were authors that. I sort of gravitated towards for my daughters when they were in elementary school, um, you know, who sort of started that work, Uma Krishna Swami and Chitra Banerjee Devakurani, like they had created these stories that we sort of were like, oh my God, there isn't, there's somebody who's writing our stories here. So there are certainly authors who have, who have um, laid the foundation, so many that I don't even, I can't even name, but you're right. When I was growing up and, it, and even when my children were little, um, the kinds of stories that I had access to were, you know, were like the Enid Blyton's or the Secret Gardens or, you know, Tarzan's like by Briggs. Like there were just these, these, of these stories that were, that had very white centric characters that were steeped in, steeped in post-colonial sort of norms and values and, and things that we didn't even realize that we were, we enjoyed them. I loved them. They were great stories, but we had no idea of like what we were sort of Im imbibing um, because we had, didn't have access to other things, you know? Um, I was so excited to have like the RK Narns to read when I was little, the Malgudi day stories. Like those were so much fun for me because it was like, wait, this is a story about a little kid in South India. That's exactly like, you know, where I came from. But then having come here for my girls who are Indian American and for me myself, because I've straddled cultures all my life, um, to have stories that reflect who we are here in this country, I think is very new. And that is really, I think, powerful. And that was definitely one of the reasons why I, I also wanted to write stories about just Americans who were Indians, you know, because I felt like my girls didn't have that. Yeah, um, and having also grown up on similar um, similar narratives that were really wonderful and and were more white centric, but lacking those female role models, characters, stories, um, I'm just so excited that our next future generation will get to have that, and you know potentially my future daughters or sons will get to be able to read your stories. Yeah, my girls were just um, saying the other day, we were talking and, and they, you know, like now when they enter a bookstore, the, um, the, there's so much more diversity in what's available for them. Um, not just about, you know, they see stories, but about a multiplicity of perspectives that, you know, are, that we couldn't have even thought of like 10, 15 years ago. So that really is um, something to be grateful for. For sure. Yeah, um, this actually kind of gets into the next question that I, I have for you, which is, um, what were some of the challenges that you ran into when you were trying to mm -hmm. um, create these stories um, from, you know, it's, it's really coming from the heart and your imagination and, and developing these, uh, these pieces of art. Um, but there is a lot that goes into the the production of books, um, as well as um, the whole editorial process and the, the illustration process? Um, sure. I think the challenges sort of run on, um, I guess, on different tracks, potentially. So in terms of just thinking that you're a writer, that's a challenge in and of itself, right? Like believing that you can write the story, that 
you can tell the story that someone's going to want to listen and read the story. So that is a challenge because for many years I was like, nah, this is not, I can't do this. This is going to be too difficult. Like no one, it's not good enough. Who's going to want to listen to the story. So that's sort of that self doubt, I think is that one track of, um, having to overcome that and then getting to the point of saying, you know what, I'm going to really envision that this book can be published. And what are the things that I need to do working backwards and sort of moving along that. That was definitely a very conscious step that I had to take to sort of overcome my challenges. Because before getting to that point, I had sort of like dabbled in looking into like, what does it mean to publish a children's book? What what are the steps I would have to take? And it was all very intimidating, Arvita. It just felt very huge and big and so, so that was that other layer of like, well, who wants to listen to my story but, and read it, but then who's also going to want to publish it? So that was the other layer of, I think that was super challenging as well. Just thinking about like believing yourself and then feeling like you can overcome this, what seems to be a very intimidating publishing industry. Um, and where does one even begin? And then, then of course, there's the whole thing of like, all right, so I'm putting myself out in the world. I'm going to tell the story. Look, people are going to read it. it other DCs you know, are going to read it, you know, within our community. And I'm like, ah, what are they going to think? So that whole feeling of like, you know, you're going to get judged. You're putting yourself out there and sort of being vulnerable in your art. And, um, you know, that that's kind of a hard thing I, that I think all creatives probably have, right? Like, all creatives have that. So that was definitely another level of challenge for me that I had to sort of think about. and. Um, and sort of say, it's fine. Like, you know, one of the things that I think I read on my website is like, a writer only writes a book, but the reader finishes it. So you have to get it out there. For me, writing wasn't about just writing it for myself. I really wanted it to be out in the world for children to be able to look at and read. Um, because I think of, I think of ID, writing as sort of like an act of resistance, um, just like teaching, I think is also an act of resistance, right? So if I'm not putting the material out in the world, then how is that how is that going to manifest itself for young children? So those were all definite challenges. And then just a very, a, to your point about like, what are the challenges in getting a book put together? Oh my gosh, that's like a whole nother layer because the, the, <laughs> the publishing industry is a very competitive one. Um, it, but it's, the writing community is a really supportive one. So there's like these ways that you can um, learn about how to navigate the publishing industry um, where you can build up your resources. I think those are, um, find your support networks that will help you sort of figure out what the paths are to take. Um, that can help you in those challenges. Um, so yeah, you know, finding an agent who's going to believe in your work, challenging, very challenging, um, because ha you have to have a partner doing it by yourself is super hard. Um, so if you can find someone who loves the body of your work and is like, I'm willing to be your champion and get your work out there. And then, then that agent's job is to like find the editor who's going to love your work. So that's another layer of challenge. Um, and then once you found the editor, I've been super lucky with all my editors who have been, um, I have, you know, seven books coming out, uh, with six different publishing houses and, it's been, it's been really wonderful so far in terms of the partnership that we've had about looking at the manuscript and, you know, deciding who the illustrators are going to be. Um, and I think it's, it's just a question of finding those right partners to make that challenge, challenge a little less intimidating. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and I think it's, um, it's wonderful that you, you kind of separate out kind of like the internal uh, challenges around self-confidence as well as like the challenge of finding the right um, partnerships or collaborations um, to help support um, your your growing uh, body of work um, I um, I'm, I'm just I wonder like were there when you were going through that process um what came first? Um, were you, what kind of helped build that confidence muscle for you that you finally got to the point of like, no, I'm, I'm actually going to do this. Um, were you, did you, um, 
did you kind of uh, reach that point on your own or were you in communication with other authors or um, or um, in collaboration or with publishers for for other reasons and and it came about that's a great question and uh, the point at which I decided that I was going to put myself out there in terms of this particular manuscript that I had written, um, that came that came to me by my, like I made that decision by myself before I had even you know reached out to a writing community or knew any like I just said, all right, I want I want this book out there. It's going to get published. What do I need to do to make that happen? Okay, I need to learn about the publishing world. I need to figure out like what are what what needs to happen. So that internal decision came before I had created any sort of network and support. To get to the point of believing myself to be a writer, and um, that took more time, and that occurred during the process of reaching out to the writing community. And so the first step I took was actually, you know, sending my manuscript out to another author. I didn't know her. I just researched on the internet um, authors who were offering manuscript critiques, who would, you know, paid manuscript critiques. I researched different ones and then finally decided to send to this one author, Lola Schaefer. You know, blind, I just reached out to her. I'm like, hey, you know, here's what I'm trying to do. And she's like, absolutely, here's, here are my rates. Um, send it to me and I'll let you know, um, you know, when I can get it back to you. She was wonderful, just really wonderful. And was, was, you know, we had a call and she's like, listen, I don't tell this to a lot of people because I get a lot of junk, but you are a writer is what she told me. And that was because I was like, I'm not going to believe my family or my friends, which is what I will tell all creatives. Like your family and friends are all going to think you're wonderful. That is not they're great and they should, but you need to, you know, reach out to, um, other people who know their, who know the craft and who will be able to give you solid constructive feedback. And she did that. She was really wonderful. And then offered me advice, like, you know, you should join this organization for writers and reach out to these particular editors. And that's when, again, still not believing I'm a writer, but okay, that maybe there's something there. Was that was the first step to me joining, you know, writers groups, writers organizations, starting to attend conferences and realizing, you know, people were like, get on Twitter, the writing community is beautiful on Twitter, which they are, and start networking with other writers. And at my first big uh, retreat, right, writers conference um, in Pennsylvania, the Highlights Foundation, amongst writers amongst these professional, amazing writers and other people who were learning along with me was the first time that I said, I think I'm a writer. And that was a year. It took um, maybe a little less than a year from when I decided that I was going to move forward with this, yeah, with this new direction in my life. And I was still teaching then, still teaching full time at that point when it was great. But um, yeah, that was a huge moment for me to say that I am a writer because I didn't really believe it until then. Wow. It's crazy. You know, um, what intrigues me um, in hearing you share this is, um, is like um, the question of like, what, what got in the way of you feeling that self-confidence um and, and proclaiming yourself to be a, a writer or an, or an author, um, were what like now reflecting back on that experience, um, is there are there pieces that you identify that that felt like blockages in your way? Um, I can't point to anything specific. I think it all has to do with. First of all, never having that, I had never identified myself as a writer before. I knew I, I mean, I wrote as a teacher. I wrote academic things. I had written for teacher magazines. I had been published as a as a teacher, as an educator about curriculum, and I had, you know, so that was a different kind of writing. And I never really saw myself as a as a uh, 
as another kind of writer. Uh, you know, back, I went when I was in, in India earlier this year, my, I was looking through all our school reports. My mother has kept all of these reports that I wrote and my brother's writings. And I was looking through them and I was trying to see like, was I, was there something that I forgot about myself as a little kid in school? No, I really didn't like to write in school. I didn't like to write. I wrote reports. They were kind of pedantic. My brother, however, had like these amazing, I was like, oh my God, he's such a great writer. So I think for, like, I just didn't consider myself a writer. I had like real doubts about that ability in myself. Um, and it's, I guess it's a skill that I just have been working on and growing and sort of building my confidence in, um, because that was never my identity. I'm a fabulous teacher. I love teaching. I, you know, I, that's who I've always been. So like adding this whole new identity has been like a process for me. Does that answer your question, yeah. Arpita? It does. I think, um, I, I often wonder, um, I think not having like a lot of, I think other South Asian role models, whether that kind of influences um, the way that we um, we see ourselves or how we can limit ourselves. Um, now I have a role model like you who who has who's actually written children's books, and so I feel like my world is expanded as I'm um, as I'm hearing you speak. But I um, I definitely understand like the internal kind of um, that, that sort of comparison, uh, that happens where you're, you're like, oh, this person has put in so much more effort into their craft and they're so much more so concentrated or ability to create something beautiful. Like, I, I, can I do that at the same level? Am, am I worthy of, you know, of being called a writer? Yeah. And also I'm, I'm also like much older then, you know, a lot of young writers are like, right, there's so many beautiful young writers writing. And I'm like, oh, this is like, it was never a career path that I thought about. So you also think about, oh, is this, does it even make sense for me to try something out, um, you know, this much later in life? And of course it does, 100%. Like, I'm all about, like, learning and renewing and tr trying new things. So, but, but that's also a little bit of that, right? Like, it's like, oh, you're trying something completely new that you'd never, ever tried before. Well, out there, all of you who are listening, I'm like, go for it. Yes, you can. <laughs> yes, you can. Yeah, I, I'm so glad you said that because I, I think that is a concern for a lot of, of people who choose other career paths in life. And um, they may, they may want to do something more creative, but oftentimes, um, even being an immigrant, it's very hard to choose more creative pathways because you're so concerned yeah. about financial security. Um, but to see someone who, um, who has had another career, but has also chosen to explore this aspect of themselves is really wonderful. I think writing definitely lends itself to being something that you can do a second like is and you don't have to only be a writer. In fact, I don't recommend it because it doesn't, you know, it's not a lot of, you can't make a lot of money writing children's picture books. That's not why we write. Um, so you definitely want to have another job, but it's an amazing way of, I think for me, especially being able to contribute in a different way. Yeah. Um, and you're, you're creating a legacy really and uh, a space for, uh, for future generations and um, and a different kind of culture to exist in in the process of of creating these books. Yes, for sure. I mean, my first one, American Daisy, which just came out. I love it when young Daisy kids sort of like look at it, and then when I see their faces as they're turning the pages and they're recognizing all these different things about the girl in the story and how it connects with them. Like I'm like okay. That's it. This is great because my girls didn't have that. And I'm so I didn't have that. And I'm so happy that, you know, they have that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really wonderful. Um, so something else you kind of mentioned um, earlier was uh, so you talked about kind of like the internal um, kind of challenges you face, but also mm -hmm. the support system that you were able to build for yourself. Um, and you talked about joining writers groups and, and yeah. connecting with others. Um, I'd love it if you could share a little bit more about that and 
um, how those support systems, how, how much you utilize them and, um, and how they function for folks who might be interested in, in learning more about this process? Sure. Um, so I think the, the organization that I would recommend that everyone, sort of, if they're writing children's books, this, this is a little different if you're um, actually Society of Children. Yeah, SCBWI is for children's uh, books, but there will be like similar organizations for people who would like to write, you know, for young adults or for um, adults. Um, so the Society for Children's Book Illustrators and Writers, um, or Writers and Illustrators, rather, SCBWI is a national organization, but they also have local chapters. And joining that organization um, allowed me to connect with um, a lot of industry professionals who were doing webinars and, con you know, there are conferences you can attend where you can learn from other writers, other um, from editors, from people in the publishing industry, agents, and sort of connect with them and learn a little bit more about what the industry is all about. So I joined that organization, both the national and the local. And then I looked for conferences in my area, local conferences, some of them. Um, now it's easier because, um, you know, you can do a lot of these things online before the pandemic, that was not a thing. So you would often have to go to conferences like physically, but now I feel like you can do some of these, um, webinars and conferences online. So it's much more cost effective. And, um, if you become a member, then they, you know, they're also members fees are like cut, uh, reduced. Um, and those are also opportunities to learn the craft of writing. So you're sort of, you're, you're learning not only about the industry in these, in these, you know, conferences and these webinars, but you're also learning about the craft of writing. So you can also take classes about like, what does it mean um, to write a picture book? What are the elements of a picture book or a middle grade novel or a chapter book series, depending on what you're interested in writing? So um, that is really what I did in the beginning was just a lot of learning and reading. Um, because I didn't, you know, you have to find an agent, but that was not even something that I was thinking about because you have to perfect your, your manuscripts first and figure out, get people to critique them. Oh, the other thing I would recommend is to find a critique group, which you can do through your national SCBWI or your national writing organization. Other people who are also writing and working towards becoming published writers, you form a critique group and then you meet regularly and you read each other's manuscript. And because you are all working uh, towards writing, you're learning the craft of writing, you can provide each other with effective feedback. Um, and, you know, you might have to like figure out what's the right um, critique group for you. Sometimes critique groups mesh really well. Sometimes they don't. Um, I'm a member of a few. I have several writing partners and they're all amazing. Um, and basically that's another way of honing your craft and learning from each other. Uh, and then it's also a really great supportive network because they are also going on the same journey as you in terms of like, um, so they understand the obstacles uh, and they also understand the publishing industry because they're also um, on that same journey with you. So um, I'm trying to think about answering your question. So those are some of the basic things that I think anyone who wants to write needs to do. Um, and of course, depending on what it is that you are interested in writing, I uh, you should be reading a lot in that genre. So if you want to write picture books, you need to read a lot of picture books because there is a very particular, um, there's a very particular skill to telling a story in less than 500 words. Um, and I, cause I was a kindergarten teacher. I used to just read picture books for my, for a living. So I knew them really in and out. So I've read like a gajillion, um, and chapter books and middle grade books. So you should just read a lot of them because that's also a way of sort of researching your market um, and learning about what is it that young children are interested in and how they, and what are they reading and how, what are editors and publishers interested in? Um, what are they putting out there in the market? So um, yeah, so all of those, I would say three buckets, like lots of reading, joining professional organizations and learning about the craft and taking classes and then building a supportive writers who are doing the same kind of writing that you are and meeting with them regularly. Yeah, that's, that's super helpful um, advice, I think. And, um, and it's, it's also wonderful because you did, you kind of 
um, as a kindergarten teacher, you were also exposed to a lot of this material and that um, in in the world of teaching as well. So you had an understanding of the the students that you were um, that you were also um, working with. Yeah, yeah. I and I'm I was always you know I knew the kind of stories that I really felt drawn to as a teacher, and there's there's a range of them right that children love, but everyone has their own particular writing style. Um, and so I. The, the things that I felt were missing were the things that I wanted to write about. Um, yeah. You know, for, um, for others that might be seeking guidance um, and really maybe have only ever dabbled into this, um, this world or maybe have only ever, um, you know, um, read books and never thought about being a writer such as yourself, um, would you have any guidance or advice for them um, in in figuring that out for themselves and and kind of going along in a similar journey to kind of where where you are right now? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of what I said before applies for that. Um, you're going to have to figure out if this is something that works for you, and you have to be persistent because writing is a very lonely. It can be very lonely and you have to have people around you that are going to be happy to be along with you on this journey. So have, finding a community of writers, I think, is really important. Um, honing your craft and really um, working on your writing so that it's something that other people will want to read and um, and is excellent in and of itself, I think, is really important. Right. So doing a lot of writing in the, in the genre that you are interested in and then just perfecting it and not giving up, I think is really important. Um, finding a champion. Uh, so I think eventually getting an agent is really important, but you can't get an agent until, until you really hone your craft. And, um, uh, because agents won't, won't be interested in your work if it doesn't show to them that you are professional, that you've been really working on it, that you understand the genre that you're writing, that you, they, they, they can tell if you're just like pulling something together out of your behind, just excuse my, or you're like really been working on your craft and you understand the audience that you're writing for. So, you know, sort of working on that craft first and then finding a champion, um, for your work, because in the publishing industry, there are fewer and fewer um, publishing companies that will accept unsolicited manuscripts. There are still there are still a few, um, but mostly to get into that door, you need to have someone who's your partner. You need to have an agent who has connections and who will be your champion. It's still really hard because agents are also like they will tell you that they have to get used to rejection. <laughs> so there's a lot of rejection in the in the children's writing industry that you have to get used to, like hearing no. We love it, but oh no, we love it, but oh no. And then there's another layer of I, th I think there is for BIPOC authors for um, because only now has the publishing industry, which has been very very white up to like very white, they're really gatekeeping, right? Um, have recently begun to realize that they really need to expand their lists and, and allow for multiple voices, still have a tendency to be like, oh, well, we've got that one book, you know, written by that Indian American author. So, you know, we're going to have to like look for somebody else, right? We don't need to have another book by another Indian American author, which they would never say for like the 10 other white authors that they might have on their list, to be perfectly honest. And I think that's something that publishing is sort of reflecting on and becoming more aware of. And so in their little, you know, conference rooms or whatever, they're having these conversations about what is a good story and what does that mean? And how are those stories told? And then the other thing I want to say, Arpita, I think that's really important for people out there who are wanting to write is just, you know, write what, what, you know, like write your story, write what comes from your heart. And regardless of how specific it is, because, those specific stories can, I think, will reach out to like the universal truth. Like think about the books that we've read that had nothing to do with who we were and where we came from, but yet we were, we sort of connected with those stories because of the themes. So to those of you out there who, who have a story to tell, like just tell it, like speak from your heart and tell it. And if you work on the craft and tell it in a really beautiful way, it's, and don't give up, 
it will find its way out there. Um, and it'll be a story that needs to be read by somebody who will be really happy to have that you've written it. Yeah. You know? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, I love yeah. that. And it, it makes me like inspired to, to one day think about writing. So this is really, um, I'm, it's just so uh, nice having you like with the, uh, provide that kind of passion and, um, and, and speaking the kind of like the truth of the challenges that exist around, um, around the publishing world. Um, I, I, I'd love to, because we've talked a lot about the process, but I'd love, um, I'd love to have you kind of share some of the the books that you've written um, or are in the process of writing, um, and yeah, just um, let us uh, let us know more about them. Um, sure. So I mentioned American Daisy already. That is a rhyming picture book about a young girl. Um, who's sort of straddling her Indian self and her American self. It's very much a story of me growing up because I grew up in a very American environment in international schools, having grown up in international schools, but living in a very South Indian home um, and yet living in Indonesia or Thailand, like in a third, cult, third culture. So we're you know called third culture kids. So like sort of straddling that world and always feeling like, I never quite fit in anywhere. I was never, you know, quite Indian enough. Like I was always pegged as a Firangi as soon as we went back to India. Like automatically, I didn't even have to open my mouth and people would be like, oh, she's a Firangi, you know? And I was like, my gosh, I'm Indian, hello. And then, you know, when I was, and I'm here, it's like, yeah, I sound American, but you know, where are you from? Oh, wow, your English is so great. Oh, you don't have an accent. I'm like, mm. <laughs> you know, so, so American Daisy sort of arose out of all of those feelings. Um, and then also it, it's dedicated to my girls, Vedika and Kirti, and it's um, about them. And they are straddling their American and Indian selves as well. So that's the first book that came out. And honestly, um, I never thought I would write fiction. That's here's the other thing to writers. You never know what's going to come out of your heart. Um, I always thought it was going to be nonfiction stories that I was going to write. And that first story that got me on this journey, that's still waiting to find an editor. So that's something to also think about. It's never that first story that you think is going to get out there. This was like the fourth thing that I wrote because all the other things I had written were nonfiction. And from some reason, this poem came out of me um, one day, no idea that I could rhyme, no idea that I was going to write this rhyming picture book. So you just have, I, I guess something sort of opened up and, um, yeah. So American Daisy, my first rhyming picture book that just came out. Um, and then my second one, which comes out in November is called my Pati's Saris. Um, Pati means, um, grandma in Tamil. And that's a story about, um, a grandmother and her grandson. And it's set in Chennai, India, um, where my parents are now, um, so I'm half, I'm sort of Tamilian and I'm Kerala and Tamil Nadu sort of this mix. Um, but Tamil was a huge part of our, that was how we spoke at home with Hindi also mixed in and English. And this story is about a little boy and his grandmother and how he loves her saris and how she makes him feel safe and how he likes to dress up in them. And sort of like the story sort of grows from that. And Art, who's the illustrator, did an amazing job of, showcasing the love and security and that beautiful relationship that the grandmother and the grandson have in sort of like the comfort that the boy has in feeling safe in expressing who he is. Um, so that's the second one. Um, should I tell you about the others too? I have like four more. Um, yeah, I'd love to. And I'd also love to add them to, um, to the, uh, description afterwards so that our viewers and listeners have a chance to also check them out. Oh, thank you. So uh, the third one is called Desert Queen. It's being published by Levine Querido. That comes out in March. And that one is actually a picture book biography. So that is non -fic. Well, it's inspired by um, uh, Queen Harish, who is a uh, drag dancer, um, from Rajasthan. I met 
Queen Harish in Rajasthan when I was there with my family um, and had the the honor of watching her perform to a sold out crowd in the Thar Desert and was just blown away by her vitality and joy and like warmth and love that she shared with the audience as she was performing. Um, she actually came over to our table, met my parents. Um, I was my dad who was going to turn A. She sort of touched their feet and was like invited them on stage and she danced. It was like amazing. It was just the most amazing experience. And we spoke a little bit afterwards and I knew that I was going to write something about her. Um, and then unfortunately, about six months later, I found out that Hadish had died in a car accident. Uh, it was a really big loss for the community. And I just was like, I have to write this book. Um, and so it's a picture book biography inspired by their life. And um, it came out in lyrical verse. I struggled a lot with how to write this story. Yeah. I tried a lot of different structures. And then finally, it came out in lyrical verse. And the very talented Swabu Kohli, who's based out of, I believe, Goa, is I've seen some of the initial sketches and they're just mind blowing. Um, so that's coming out in March. So look out for that. I have one sweet song coming out. Stop me whenever I'm Arpita, if you have a question or whatever. Um, one sweet song come out coming is coming out by Candlewick in the fall of 2023. That one is was inspired by the pandemic. I wrote it during the pandemic. It was inspired by the um, the singers and the musicians in Italy who were singing out of their balconies when they were connecting together and um, watching that. I was, I, you know, there were so many feelings that we were experiencing right during this time, isolation and yet togetherness. It was just this weird, it was just so weird. And one sweet song came out of that. So it's about a community that comes together in song. Um, and I envisioned a New York of course, urban neighborhood, but I think the story could be set like in any urban neighborhood uh, or any city, anywhere really. So that's one sweet song. Um, and that's also in rhyme. Ha! Uh, Sister Day comes out from FSG in winter of 2024. It's a story about two sisters also in rhyme. Again, who knew I could rhyme? I didn't. Uh, it's a rhyming story about two sisters and sort of the arc of their day when they sort of go out to play. And then this moment where they clash and have this sort of like moment where disharmony and then they're really upset and then they come back and play together again. It's really uh, inspired by my daughters um, and how close they are to each other and how much when they sort of like when they have those moments of like fighting, it like it really like breaks their heart when when that happens. Um, so it's, it's about that. And it is about two Desi girls that, that one happens to be about two Indian American girls. I was very particular that I wanted to be about two Desi kids. Um, and then the final one that has been announced is called love is here with you again by Candlewick as well. That comes out in 2024 and that's a lullaby. Um, it's inspired by this very old, a song Malayalam lullaby that my mom used to sing to me and my brother. And then she taught me and I used to sing to the girls. And um, I sort of wrote a lullaby in English for young children. And it's got, it has a lot of Hindu goddess and gods and goddesses in the lullaby who are protecting the child or as we're putting um, this child to sleep. Um, it's also inspired by Carnatic classical music, sort of like the, you know, how all Carnatic music is like praise to, to, to God. So it's sort of like that. Uh, it's sort of a combination of those two together that comes out also. Yeah. 2024. And then I have one more that I can't talk about because it hasn't been announced yet. <laughs> like we're not allowed to talk. Publishing is like, shh, um, because the illustrator hasn't been confirmed. They're working on the illustrator right now. So once that gets confirmed, then I can talk about it, but it is an ABC book. It has to do with, um, names and, um, I'm very excited by that one. That one is it rhyming? It is not. It's lyrical. It's not. Rhyme. It's an ABC book. Yeah. And those are my books. My gosh, that's, that's, <laughs> and I'm working on a few more. So my agent has some more out in submission. Um, and I have a bunch of others that we're working on and 
that's the other thing about publishing. Like I have to, I'm trying to branch out and not just do picture books. I'm trying to work on maybe some early readers, potentially working on a young adult novel in verse. Um, again, very new, again, something I've never tried before, but I'm just like, go for it. Just go for it and work on it. Who knows? You know? Oh my gosh. Um, I love, I'm, I love, and I'm so excited to one day read all of these. So just the number, the sheer number of projects that you have ongoing. Well, I'd love to just like close us off by asking, like, how do you get all of this inspiration and then work through kind of the process of building out these, um, these ideas that you have? Because it can be so scary to just come up with a concept um, and then, uh, and then you get overwhelmed with the process of actually um, like completing it and then putting it out. So um, I, yeah, I'd love to, to know more about that. Oh, that's, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so ideas come to me in many different ways. So sometimes Sometimes like this, the American Desi poem that I didn't even know I had in me came, it actually was written first as a poem for adults, which I wrote. Um, it was a terrible poem. It was terrible. Um, but for some reason that sort of just stayed with me. And as I thought about it more and more, when I ended up thinking about it, as I, I realized that what I really needed to write it as was as a, a young, as a, from the young child's perspective. And that's when it came out and it sort of flowed. So that one came out pretty quickly, actually. But then when I'm working on like a nonfiction one, um, so, so for example, Desert Queen, I had to do a lot of research first. And that's the other thing you can get, you know, you can have like analysis paralysis because you have so much information and then trying to figure out like, what is the heart of the story that you really want to tell? You're right. That can be very, very hard to figure out. And so it did take me a while. And sometimes you have to know to set it aside and not worry about it for a while and let your brain do some silent thinking so that when you come back to it, maybe something has a surfaces that you didn't know was there. And that did happen to me with Desert Queen because I really struggled with how to tell it. It was like very blah for a very long time. And if something happened, I think I was listening to some music. And then the fact that I connected with that and the fact that Harish is a dancer made me think about using lyrical verse to write the story as if it was a dance. Um, it's yeah, so Some stories come out of me super easy. Like One Sweet Song came out pretty quickly. And then others... Um, like the one that's out on submission now that my agent has that I haven't shared with you. Cause it, you know, I don't know where it's going to go. Um, oh my gosh, that took me more than two years. I had to, it has gone through lots of critiques. People were like, love it, but this is happening. But, and then I would get conflicting critiques from my writer friends. And then I was just like, ah, I wanted to tear my hair out. Cause I didn't know where it was going. People were like, I can't figure out what the heart of this story is. And so then I finally just shoved it into my, metaphorical drawer and didn't look at it for more than a year. My agent said to me, I wonder if this could be a story about this instead of what you're trying to do. What if it's a story about this? And I think that's where your heart is. And I was like, oh, and then I like shoved it away. And then after a year, I took it out. And then that whole new story came out from a, in a completely different way where maybe like a, the, some things remain, but mostly the story changed completely, but the heart of it, I think I had figured out what it was. So that can be really hard. Like, what is it that you're really trying to say through the story that you are not saying because you've gotten caught up in all your darlings, like all the words or the language or whatever it is that you've like layered your story with. Um, and so it, every story has its own process and it can be really hard. I've had moments also, and this is to writers out there where I thought I'm never going to write another story again. Oh my God. And I had like panic attack where I thought I haven't written anything new. Oh my God, what am I going to do? And I would just say like, it's okay to be fallow. It's okay to let the soil be nourished by craft work or reading other things or doing something completely different because it will come back. Um, like whatever it is that you thought you had and this had lost. <laughs> I have had that feeling. I've like told my agent, I'm like, oh my God, I haven't written anything in you. She's like, Jyoti, we have so many stories that you already have. Like, don't stress yourself. Like you just, 
don't stress, just you'll do your thing. It'll, something will happen. And she was right. Like I just wrote something new the other day that I sent to her. Um, so it's about trusting the process. It, that takes time too. Like, so now I've been doing this for four years, which is very young in the writing life, I guess. Um, but it's, it, I won't, I won't lie and say it's easy because imposter syndrome is very real. And again, my books are not out there. That's the other thing. Like, what if no one buys my books, Arpita? Oh no, publishers will not buy another manuscript because, and my agent is like, it doesn't work that way. Picture books have really long shelf lives. Just relax. Just write your story. Don't worry. (laughs) So, Yeah, but I could definitely see that. Like, especially if you, if you don't really understand the industry that well, or you just, it's like you have this vision in your head of what you want to produce, but then, um, but then you've created it and then you don't know whether anyone will care. And you just like that, that fear of rejection can be so strong when it's something that makes you feel so vulnerable. Yeah, it's so true. And then of course, you know, we're human. So we're comparing ourselves with like, what are, what is happening with other writers and I'm a member of the Writing Barn, which is this amazing community in Austin, Texas. And, you know, Bethany Hecatus, who heads that up, will talk about, you know, compare despair. She's like, that's like such a thing that writers have. Like, we're like, oh, no, that writing journey is going that way. How come mine isn't going that way? And you have to sort of calm yourself down and be like, everyone is going on their own journey. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. I mean, you're doing the work. You're putting your work out there. Ultimately, you have no control over, like, how it's going to be received and you can just do your best and know that there are champions for it. And ultimately that's all you can do. And then you just go on to the next thing, you know? Yeah. It's hard though. I think the creative journey of, of an artist, a writer, um, it's, it's very, um, it's very difficult in that way where you're, you're so focused on producing this, um, this voice that's coming out of you. Um, and it's hard because it's, it's not necessarily, um, you know, there, there are so many multiple layers to creating the quality of the craft that you want. Um, and sometimes it can come out quickly or sometimes it can take years for that one piece of work to come out. So it's just, like, thank you for sharing that. Cause I think that's, it's so honest. Um, you know, there, there's just so much in it that, um, that can become roadblocks in your own thought process. Um, yeah. So I, I just appreciate you so much for being honest about that. Yeah. Thank you. I, I knowing for myself, I think this is, uh, it's something that we all creatives go through and I think like owning it and like knowing that it happens and just being really honest about it because it seems like everyone's like, Oh, they're just creating stories. And it's like, it's out there in the world. And I think it's important for people to understand there's so much work before that, even like, like to your point, there's so much work that came before that and disappointments and revisions and like hurdles that got to that point. So don't be afraid of all of that because it's going to happen. Um, and sometimes it'll be easier and other times it's going to be super, super crazy making. Um, but hopefully it takes, it takes the time it takes. It'll, it'll, it, it'll get to where it needs to be. And if you have other people fighting for you as well and being your partners, I think that makes it easier. And also do something else besides just writing. Because that'll drive you crazy if you're just writing. Like some people are very lucky and they can do it and earn money and do whatever. But the waiting, oh, that's the other thing. The waiting in the publishing industry is insane. Like how much you have to wait before you hear back. It's like months and months, Arpita. All right. So you've sent off to an agent. They may not respond to you for months. That's very normal. So be ready for that. Editors may not respond to you for months. Very normal. I, a picture book takes anywhere from two, takes two years from acquisition of the manuscript to actual publication of the book. And that's with no hitch. 
that's with no hitch. So it all takes a lot of time. So make sure you have lots of other things going on because refreshing that, refreshing that email gets old really fast and I do it a lot. Wow. The timelines are so long. Um, and, and it also, I think it's also kind of comforting too. And, 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 in understanding how long that process is, because I think, um, especially as like folks who might be interested or intrigued by the process, um, you know, they don't necessarily know all of the the pieces that come into this. Like, I'm sure you yourself, like, um, did you like, had you any idea that it would take this long when you first started? Um, because I knew nothing about the children's industry, even though I've read a gajillion picture books, but who knew anything about like what, how they were made. Um, So learning about that sauce was really interesting, but I did a lot of like, again, I did a lot of researching and talking to people and learning about it as I was going through it. So I began to be aware that this was going to take time. And I also want to say that I'm talking about traditionally published, right? I'm not even talking, I'm just talking specifically about traditionally published uh, children's books. Self-publishing is definitely another route that people can take. I chose not to take it. Um, I didn't even think about it because that's a whole nother kettle of fish. Um, but that's certainly some uh, something that you can do. And SCBWI does now have um, a, a you know forum around that, so you could join SCBWI if you were also thinking of pub- publishing, self publishing. Um, yeah, so it, I had to learn a lot. The other thing that I found to, to be so fascinating, Arpita, is learning about the illustrator's role in picture books and realizing, I, I mean, I knew it on some level because as a picture book writer, as a picture book, uh, as a teacher reading picture books, my students and I would talk all the time about the play of text and, you know, pictures and how important those pictures were. But as a text writer, you realize even more how important it is to have an illustrator who is your partner, because that book no longer becomes just my picture book. It is me and the illustrator who are partners in creating this book it is now our story. And it is, has been so wonderful to see how illustrators whom we don't really speak with in the process of the, you know, I don't know who they are. The publishers do check in with me. They were like, what do you think about these illustrators? Like, and then we have a conversation and then I might give them my top choices. Um, for American Daisy and for Desert Queen, I actually was the one that found the illustrators or at least suggested the illustrators to my publishers and they ended up loving them and saying, yes, let's go with them. Um, but you know, you don't always know how it's going to work out. And it's been amazing to see how illustrators elevate and make your text even better, like even better. You have to trust that process and whatever vision you may have had, like they're going to make it 100 times better because that's their job. That's been really beautiful to watch. And I'm like, so grateful for that. Because without them, the book would be nothing. And that's been wonderful. It's like uh, just knowing how this partnership, um, finding the right partners and going through this process with them helps to, to build that trust and ultimately the creation of something far beyond your own imagination. Yeah, I think it's important that I, w- I want to really point out to your um, audience is that through through writing these picture books and through partnering with illustrators, uh, both my agent and I were really, we really wanted illustrators who would, um, who were also, uh, BIPOC if possible. Um, so that we could, you know, sort of highlight the diversity of creators in our, in our stories. Um, but I really wanted these books out there because they do sort of interrupt Um, all the traditional kind of picture books that have come in the past because they do sort of tell stories of people whose stories have not been told before as much. And so having partners who also understand that and who elevate your text and like share your story in ways that like show images to children that interrupt those previous narratives and, and showcase these different images, I think is like so important for, um, young people. Does that make sense? Yeah. I don't, I just felt like. No, it it makes a lot of sense. Um, and 
Um, and being kind of an, an artist in my spare time myself, I, I definitely can understand um, just the, the nuance and the perspective that you bring um, is so different simply because of your own story and your own background. Um, and there's a value to that that I think um, we don't necessarily recognize all the time. Yeah. Well, um, I, I want to um, end this by just saying um, to, to those who are listening or watching, I hope that uh, I hope this conversation has really um, not only inspired you to um, to read more books like Jyoti's, which we'll link in the description, but also to really think about um, think about what it means to be a writer and um, the importance of having more um, POC, BIPOC um, writers themselves um, and more writers within the South Asian community um, and how powerful um, just those perspectives can be in shifting culture um, and um, providing lenses of looking at the world that, that haven't existed before. Um, yeah. Yeah, and our community is so diverse, so we need all of our voices to be heard, right? I'm one, and we have many more other amazing authors, you know, Rajni LaRocca, Raki Mirchandani, um, so many, like so many, I can't even like think about them all right now. Vida Hiranandani, um, so many uh, uh, people who are writing, and they're all, all of their voices are telling these different stories, and we have such diversity in our community we, none of us can speak for everyone, right? So we need everyone's voices to like, so that all that diversity can be um, illuminated. I think that's really important. So yay, creatives, go for it. Woohoo!